so quick in on the video. In this truck, we talked about metrics, and we're joined by John C. Havens, who is the author of Artificial Intelligence, Embracing Our Humanity to Maximize Machines. We talked about questions like, what should be the metrics for personal success, and how can we overcome the metrics that seem to dominate our lives? This was such a thought-provoking conversation, and I hope that you all enjoy it as much as I did. So without further ado, here is the trek. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Trek. The Trek is a Civics Unplugged series where community members participate in meaningful discussions on topics that are too often neglected when thinking about building the future. Through prompting questions and provocations, we venture together into complex but important conversations related to building the future and democracy. We understand that this work requires ongoing dialogue, but it's a journey worth trekking through. I'm Madison, I'm a high school senior from Verdigris, Oklahoma, joined by some of our community members and a special guest, which you will hear from in just a moment. Uh, so we start off with a word association and tonight we're talking about metrics. So when you see your name on the screen, say the one of three words that you associate with the topic and why. Cool. Um, hey everyone, my name is Ashley. I'm 17 from Vancouver, Washington. Um, when I think about metrics, I think about I don't know, like prioritizing things. I feel like you can't, like, I feel like the whole point of measuring, like you can't really prioritize what you don't measure. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Hi everyone, I'm Julia, I'm 23 years old. Um, my three words are kind of like all in the same bubble, but I would say performance worthiness and validation because I think a lot of metrics that we think of first are like grades or even something like IQ scores it's like there's a good and a bad to these metrics and in that way it's kind of like um, a scale of worthiness and validation for people. Hi I'm Leora I'm a high school senior from outside of Boston Massachusetts. Um, my words are hard to understand um, I guess kind of similar to Julia's point about how like, I never know how to read these things when I see metrics in front of me. I always feel like I have to take it with a grain of salt if I'm not completely understanding where and how um, they came to be. Okay, hello, my name is Crystal. I'm a high school senior from Texas. When I hear the word metrics, it's a word I've only heard in English and math class. So it reminds me of poems and mathematics. All right, hi, I'm Adam. I'm from uh, Detroit, Michigan. Um, I'm 15. And uh, something that uh, metrics reminds me of is like, um, I guess measurement um, really like, um, like kind of like, uh, I guess, um, like I've heard people say when they're like talking about statistics. So I'd say like measurement of like, like measurement and data, I guess, I don't really know. Uh, I'm John. Um, I'm from Maplewood, New Jersey, near New York City. I turned 52 on uh, Sunday. It's my birthday, actually. And I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invite. Uh, metrics, I think about values, uh, counting things, and uh, changing a narrative. Those are good ones. Um, mine are choose them carefully because what metrics you choose, well, kind of piggyback on everyone, affects what you manage, what you value. Um, it's really what where, where attention goes. Yeah, and mine's pretty generally speaking, but I would say implicit but wrong when I think about what are the metrics for success in school or in 
I guess the real world, it's a lot of it is like making money or getting a grade. Uh, when in reality, those are not should not be the key indicators for success or happiness or flourishing. Um, but yeah, um, thank you all for sharing those. Now we can hop into the actual conversation. So does anyone have a question or provocation to get us started off with? If not, I think that I have one that I'd be interested to hear from people on. So my question would be, uh, what should be the metrics for personal success? Um, a kind of parallel question is what metrics kind of dominate our lives today? So we can sort of have like a, what should it be? And like, uh, is it sort of today? And for the second one, I have to call this probably very real for a lot of you, the US News and World Report, like college rankings list. I guess like kind of jumping, jumping off of that, um, it's, it's a little, it's like a, it's an answer wrapped in a funny story. Like I, the answer to the question for me is like, are my grades have dictated like so much. <laughs> of like either how I feel about myself or like the opportunities that are available to me and all of that. And so I worked so hard throughout high school to, to like really keep my grades up um, and kind of with an eye on college uh, because it's hard in our current education system not to do that. Um, and the school I ended up going to has never received my grades and will never receive my grades. <laughs> so it's kind of like a weird, what? yeah. They only, I, they only ask for my test scores, which is even worse. Um, but it, it's funny that I spent so much of my time working so diligently to, to get good grades. And in the end, it didn't, it didn't matter to a certain degree um so yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's interesting that some metrics are so powerful that they dominate areas that they were not even intended to and I think grades is a great example of that so if I think about high school and like student government I know that if I wouldn't have had good grades I for some reason would not have felt qualified to run for like class office and you know that that's the case for so many other people as well so that's just really interesting to think about as well um, I'd like to add on to that. Um, so, um, like these ones are like, I think dominate almost everyone's lives. Um, so there's like two things there's, um, wealth and like money. People would define that as like, um, like the metrics for, um, for like, uh, for like a great life. Um, so even though like they might not be, might not be like, uh, like true for like happiness and, um, in like your best life. Like, I don't think wealth and fame matter to me personally. So, and what matters is if I love what I do, so. Yeah, to that point, I remember in college when I was like iffy about like my major change and such, I was always looking at Glassdoor and like, oh, like this average salary is like, oh, should I pivot this way? Like, um, that was a big thing. And then um, now talking uh, about personal success, I would say similar to Adam, it's more about, it's there's not really number metrics to it, but like, um, fulfillment, obviously, and then like drive and longevity um, for what you're involved in rather than the number metrics behind it. I just like, it, I feel like it's been so difficult for me to like separate those things from each other, to separate the metrics that dominate my life, which are like, grades and uh, like all of the stuff we've mentioned with the metrics that actually matter to me um, for or should matter to me for my success like loving what I do fulfillment um, taking time for myself all of these things um, should be <laughs> my metrics for success 
but it's so dominated by the things that are kind of placed on to me. I, um, I guess like for me, personal success would be like, I don't know, freedom and just having the capacity to do what I want to do. Um, but I guess like Lyra to your point, I think it's like, it's hard to separate that because I mean, like even with what people like have put for like their metrics of personal success, like loving what you do and like fulfillment and freedom, like those are like just really hard things to measure. Whereas like your grades are like very easy to measure. People are already measuring that for you. And so it's like, if you can't figure out a way to measure what is really important to you, other people like have decided that for you and like, you're just gonna go with the default. Whoa, that's a great point, the default. Also like, it's very difficult when the culture doesn't incentivize people to uh, like do what actually gives them fulfillment. Like, you know, there's like a narrative for like, people who work in like the nonprofit space. I know Ashley, you've talked about this, that like you're gonna be starving or like, oh, you shouldn't go into like acting or the arts or whatever because you're not gonna be able to feed your family. So it's like they're working against each other, which makes it even more difficult. I think that's what, um, that is something I've seen dominating my own life to the extent that Anytime I go to school, um, the number one narrative that's pushed down on students is make sure to do things that make you look good instead of ensuring that uh, you find your own personal success through finding what you think, through, by finding what you find to bring you happiness. And that's something that is like very disheartening to see uh, younger students ask the senior students because they're like, okay, what do I have to do? in order to succeed in this, which is also um, what everyone else brought up, like getting into a good school that's ranked high, um, getting like rich, getting a lot of um, publicity instead of thinking, okay, what should I do so that I can explore what brings me happiness? So um, Dariel was showing me how he, um, has been filling out his college applications on the Common App, and I'm sure you all know this. Um, you fill, you put in your your extra extracurriculars, and they literally they literally say this is a like a grade A or sorry, like a grade A through A like Z involvement or something, and or some like it's on it's on some clear scale, right? And so like if you're like the the head of some club, like that has X number of people in it then it's like this type of, um, it, it'll be this impressive basically. That's what the system um, evaluates it as. Or maybe, I don't know if it's Common App or maybe that's some scholarship application, I don't know. But like, you know, how can you blame kids for reverse engineering from the systems that are basically saying you're impressive or not? It just makes sense, it's logical, so it's, 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 it's rational for you to just maximize your signal over other metrics that are more correlated to your flourishing. Yeah, well, I mean, what's so harmful about metrics a lot of times, it's like, it's trying to quantify things that like can't be quantified. If you think about like, when I was talking about my involvement with CU on the Common App, I'm like, what in the world am I supposed to put? Like they give you like, 100 characters or something 100 characters not 100 words to describe like what it is that you do and so it's like if they have an exact scale for like what each position correlates to like it's just like flat out wrong yeah um oh yeah okay great yeah no i, I didn't want to this is so cool to hear you all say this and uh so I'll talk for a minute and cut me off if because uh, I don't want to keep the conversation from happening. But there's a, a wonderful, beautiful science, which you all may have heard of, uh, if you know, flourishing, which is positive psychology. And uh, I first learned about it when my, uh, my dad uh, passed away about 10 years ago because he was a psychiatrist. And uh, the basic idea behind positive psychology, if you don't know it, 
uh, more specifically is that traditional psychoanalysis, uh, if you picture like a vase with water in it, the logic of say like Freud and Jung and kind of you know, therapy is to remove the pain, right? If the water in the vase is pain and the logic is you want to, which is makes sense, right? That's a good thing. But it doesn't actually fill it back up with positive affect. And what people don't realize is that in the same way, if I said to you, hey, you should go to the gym and eat good food to have physical well-being, you'd be like, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Einstein. That's really exciting news. But mental health is the exact same thing. And taking actions like gratitude, altruism, uh, being with family, or there's a whole uh, book, I highly recommend it. It's a little technical, but it's a really good read called Flow. And flow is the science of when you're doing something purpose-driven in your life. And that can be anything from like, say, playing an instrument, um, the flow state. Uh, athletes often talk about it. You know, when you're like in the middle of a race, you're not really happy necessarily when you're like just about to, you know, get to the, the a sprint at a race. You may be physically really miserable, but you're doing something that you feel like you were built to do, whether or not you get paid. Now, the thing that's also interesting is there's a lot of stuff that you can actually measure that people tend to think is not quantifiable. But what I uh, have found in my experience, and this is also where I don't want to dictate anyone's experience, but where I do know things that you can measure versus things that aren't. Um, statistics or economics, there's a lot of stuff. Um, uh, and I'll avoid swearing because I know there's people under 18. Um, <laughs> But there's a lot of stuff with traditional economics that's just straight up BS. Like it's stuff from 300. And by the way, a fantastic book to read here. Can't recommend it highly enough. Is a book called Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Always look for books about economics by women. Wonder to why? Because the GDP doesn't measure caregiving, gross domestic product, doesn't measure caregiving. And caregiving really globally um is done by women now I, I don't mean to sound sexist i mean globally so i'm talking india global south combined and also caregiving includes things like teaching but the simple fact that 70 years ago largely completely men largely men from the us and europe some from japan got together in a place called Bretton woods in new hampshire and i've been there um the actual building and the the place and put together statistical measurements after the Second World War to say we really have to build the world back up. Exponential growth was a value and an ideology, right? Because infrastructures needed to be built fast. Sadly, that same ideology has stayed with us for 70 years and has been reinforced by things like surveillance capitalism, another fantastic book by an amazing woman. Um, uh, what is it called? So I'm blanking on the first part of it. Corporate surveillance capitalism by Shoshana Zubra. The, the age of surveillance capitalism. Thank you. There it is. Um, and I'll, I'll pause a second because I could just ramble for two hours. So I'll just close this last thing is my personal faith. I went to college to think I was going to be a minister, um, but also just how I live my life is very positive psychology focused in the sense of my belief, and this is also based in the science, the empirical science of positive psychology, is that when someone is born, they have worth. All of you on the phone right now today, you have worth, uh, again, this is my belief, simply by being here. And gratitude, for instance, is the science. And here's the stuff you can measure. There are a lot of tests when you can put someone in an MRI machine or test the physiological basis of what are called the happiness hormones, dopamine, serotonin. And when you, you simply say, here are the people in my life I have today, or here are the things I have today that I'm grateful for, you can measure before and after and see someone's physiological state change. This is quantitative. You can also ask them how they feel about their life satisfaction. That's subjective data. Just because those metrics aren't asked for doesn't make them as real as frankly, a lot of the BS, and they're not all BS, but a lot of the statistical backwards facing metrics from GDP. Anyway, I'll pause there because I can keep talking. If it's useful, I'm happy to answer questions because I've written a couple books on this, but I also don't want to be talky Pete.
Um, yeah, so um, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, I've, I've learned a lot about like the power of like gratitude. I, I have a kind of gratitude practice I do sometimes um, where I write things that I'm grateful for. Um, but yeah, it really does help your like happiness and well-being and your contentment. Like before, I'm always like, oh, I want this. I want that. Um, I've also been getting into minimalism lately. Um, but I just realized that there's so many great things in my life. Like I don't I don't need a, the new phone. I don't need the new computer. Um, I'm happy with what I have. So, um, but yeah. The point you made about exponential, like being the world, being a constant state of like needing to be an exponential growth is so interesting. It reminds me of um, learning about like how differently Americans and Europeans view vacation time, like how vacation is so much more valued in, in Europe and they have so much more of it than like workers in, in America do. Anyway, that was just a connection that I made in my head. No, I'm really glad you said that, Lior. One of my favorite movies I can't recommend highly enough is the documentary called Happy, Comma, The Movie. And it was uh, the, the, the most popular iTunes documentary, I want to say, four years ago. And um, we're, I think everyone here is American, right? I think everyone mentioned the state they're from, meaning so many Americans that I know. I was an actor, by the way, for years. So if anyone wants encouragement to be an actor, let me know. I was on Broadway TV and movies. Pursue your heart. Follow your bliss. I made pretty good money, too. So anyway. The point there, though, is um, uh, so many of my friends in the arts don't have health insurance. One thing that is very easy to measure from places like Gallup or the World Health Organization is how much a person suffers, even when they know they don't have health insurance. You could be your age, meaning the age group that we're on the phone here, except for me. I think everyone's under 26 or whatever, right? you can easily measure the deleterious or negative effects on long-term health when someone does have health insurance. Some of the statistics are harrowing. I think it's like a year, a year, you know, like length of life is diminished versus whenever I go to Europe and I speak at conferences in Europe and we'll have similar conversations like we're having now, but I raise my hand a lot and I'm like, I just want to check, does everyone here have health insurance? And if all the hands go up, I remind them, Keep, keep in mind, as it doesn't minimize that they can still have pain. They can still have mental health issues. It's not like the, that, that takes away pain. But simply knowing you have health insurance is, is, is massive. Anyway, I'm just glad you brought up that point, Laura, because there's this you know, Maslow's hierarchy. I think you all, it seems like you probably know what that is. Um, these conversations, too, I'm, I'm very careful when I travel to not avoid the fact that if people don't have access to water or they feel unsafe or they don't have good health care or education opportunities, these are pretty core things where you have to try to make sure that people have equal access to those things. And then you can kind of focus on long-term flourishing on top of that. So John, that's it's super interesting what you just said about the, like how you feel if you don't have health care. Um, I, I briefly didn't have health care for like, just a few months because I like after I left my job at Google, I forgot to I, I missed some 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 deadline to sign up right for the independent contractor type healthcare. And I was like more cautious like those few months than I'd ever been. And it was like it was a constant like like I, I was always I literally was like afraid of falling uh, like like getting injured like from biking. Or getting hit by a car, um, so I can to I can totally see that. I can totally see why just like erodes your your lifespan, just like the the ambient like I could get hurt and it could be like permanently damaging, or I could die. Yeah, if you get a chance, this movie Happy the movie, it's got so many lessons from these experts the positive psychology world but the stories are the best they most immediately speak to the heart for instance the movie opens up with a documentary i forget if it's thailand or where the guy is but it's a guy who drives a rickshaw 
you, you all know what a rickshaw is like the thing with the two handles and the two wheels and it's like a it's not a taxi but it's like a bike kind of anyway this this guy who's probably in his mid-20s uh, 30s maybe he's a father they interview him and they say what's your life like how happy are you and he's just beaming he's like I'm really happy. You know, sometimes the people I pull around in my rickshaw, they'll hit me with a stick, but in, you know, I'm really happy. Right. And they cut to his family and his friends and he lives in what all of us, cause I can tell by everyone's house. I'm in my bedroom tonight cause it's quiet, but we're all in houses, right? Probably pretty nice ones. They cut to his house and it's like a tarp. It's not even like a cabin, but he's probably showing it off. And then they show his family and friends, his neighbors, and they're all just beaming. Right. Um, and I bring that up because it doesn't mean that he should not have access to water or human rights or protection. But the point is, is a lot of core aspects of well-being and flourishing are things like a larger family structure than what the Americans kind of nuclear family structure has become. Strangely, a beautiful, fantastic book called Happy City. If you want to read a great book on some of this stuff, meaning uh, urban design. It was actually when FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, created the interstate uh, highway system that a lot of uh, family happiness has decreased. Um, interestingly, because people could travel more for jobs. And in one sense, it was good because people could make money where they couldn't before. But it meant there was less time at the dinner table. And when you don't have extended families, too, like when you're surrounded by aunts and uncles, that's not good. Anyway, but they cut from this guy with a rickshaw, where at least for me as a Westerner, who's, you know, one of the top 6% and all that with a nice house and all that. Guys seems fantastic, like a lovely guy, but you see his, his surroundings and you're like, well, that's, that's interesting. He seems like he's in a rough place, but he seems really happy. Then later on in the film, not to ruin it for you, but you know, hopefully you'll watch it. Um, they show a young family from Japan, uh, a, a man and his wife and a, a little girl. I think she's like two years old. And uh, um, the, the wife is very distraught when they first show her because the father um, devastatingly has taken his own life through suicide. That is because I think the stats are the same in America and Japan, two of the most, quote, developed countries in the world. I hate that term. Hate it. I hate the term developed country. I hate it. I'll tell you why in a second. But um, to the most developed or rich or whatever term you want to use countries in the world, I'm 51, right? Guys over 40, the second leading cause of death after heart disease is suicide in America and Japan. And I'm pausing there because is a measure of success for any country, any state, how many people or the, you know, I'm not trying to be morbid, the lack of how many people decide that they are in such despair, they need to remove themselves from the planet. And for me, I have kids who are 18 and 15. And I, I want to be deeply respectful here, you know, to people in your age group, teenage suicide has increased by 50% in the last 10 years. And by the way, that doesn't mean that, you know, millions of people are, 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 are choosing that, but more that the, the numbers have increased. Uh, for me, um, I'm not here trying to in any way judge someone's decision. It's, in, as a rule, devastating, period. But also for me, I'm just speaking for myself, I would want to keep someone from that decision if possible, mainly to remove them from what I would assume is, is, a, is, is, is gross, horrible pain. And where our metrics are... are have been focusing on increasing exponential growth and wealth and exponential productivity, those directly mirror the core ideology of GDP. So for me, the really only the thing that has trickled down, and I will swear, forgive me, is this bullshit false metric of you have to always be thinking about increasing growth, money, fame, et cetera, to gain happiness, which scientifically, empirically, is false. Yeah, and it's interesting because most um, metrics that we're, we're all thinking of, it, let's say you're at 95% in a class, the second you get even a 90 on a test, like in your head, that's like the red zone because you're only, you're going, you're going percentage points down, even though like 90 is still a great score. 
Um, so it's also been like just even minor setbacks, um, whether that's GDP or whatever, as soon as you see, even with stocks, like if it goes down even 0.01%, it's in red. So it's also very interesting with that. Yeah, one of like the best pieces of advice I've ever been given was like, you're, or it was referring to something I'd done, like, yeah, it's not just good, it's good enough. Yeah. Um, which is to say like, not, and I, I, I'm kind of like a chronic perfectionist. Um, so hearing that was so helpful to just say, yeah, not everything has to just hit it, hit it out of the park. Um, what you're doing is good it's good and it's good enough was just so helpful <laughs> for me to hear. Yeah, I'm, just to put some positive energy out there because I didn't mean to bring anybody down. Um, <laughs> metrics, uh, you might know Bhutan, uh, they have something called gross national happiness, which is sort of like their GDP. Uh, a metric that they included that they've had long before anyone in the West created this idea was time well spent and time balance. Um, and it may be because I'm 50, well, almost 52 on, on Sunday. Um, you start to realize what time means and how fleeting it is, how precious it is. And don't get me wrong, grades are important. You know, I understand a 91 to a 90. You know, if you work hard to make that extra point, like, good on you. That's, that's not minor. But when you think about not to, again, not to be morbid, but if you knew that someone who you loved was sick, you wouldn't have to ask like, Oh, you know, hold on, I'm going to study for my test or I'm going to go watch some TV. Like you would be with them. Right. Because you can't get that time back. Um, and, and you don't want to live a life of regret. Right. It, and it's a, it's always a balance. We have to pay bills. Um, you know, you have to do stuff that you can eat food and pay rent, but where the message is instilled, uh, especially if it's in you all as people who are, you know, a lot younger than I am, certainly has been for me since I was your age, is this real sense of you're not worth anything until you make money. I wish it was more complex or interesting, but that's really, it's so boring. Mm -hmm. so stupid and also a lot of what i'm doing now and gary knows this he heard me soapbox the other day on her phone call um and i don't want to be a hypocrite i'm you know i'm again the top six percent and all that um but there's like 50 people that own 65 percent of the world's wealth and i i find it frankly morally reprehensible i'm trying to work around that because in terms of my faith tradition I'm, I try to lead my life with love. So to say morally reprehensible is pretty harsh, but when someone has that much wealth and they don't put it back into the system um, and then the rest of the world, the kind of status quo is like, well, let's worship, you know, Elon Musk or whoever, because he's the richest man in the world. Uh, he's a very smart guy doing some pretty cool stuff. Um, but him and the system that helps get him into where he is, is the reason that, the environment and people's mental health won't survive. And I have no interest. I have no interest. And again, I'm 51. So I think about this a lot with my kids. Uh, one thing that helps me, it's going to sound more, but then I'm going to make a turn positive is when I am nearing my death, <laughs> do I want to go, huh? I'm so glad I just kind of was lazy and let Elon Musk get richer. Or am I going to say I'm going to fight with every fiber of my being so that all of you on this call will know in your heart and your soul that as much as grades are cool, you should be thinking first and foremost about how to love the people you are around, how to care for our planet, and how to um, not fight. I would never advocate violence. But you are the generation. Like one of my biggest heroes is Greta Thunberg, that young woman. First of all, she knows her science. It's, it's, it's almost intimidating how much she knows her science. And she had a three-minute talk. You guys know what Davos is, the World Economic Forum stuff. I have a good friend leading the AI work at the World Economic Forum. Kay, she's wonderful. But at Davos, all these world leaders get together and talk about like the Paris Accord and how things have to be you know, fixed. 
And a lot of times people think that's just kind of lip service and Greta Thunberg does. Uh, and she said, um, she said, what was her line? She said, you can't negotiate with physics. It was such a beautiful statement. And her point was you all sitting around here making decisions that you're hoping policy is going to do whatever, but you're really just protecting the status quo. Our planet needs help now. Anyway, so all that is to say is encouragement too. I had wonderful, I was an actor, as I mentioned, and a wonderful acting teacher who had a great thing, which really helped me, where he said, listen, don't worry so much about all the grades and all that stuff. It's important, but you're pretty much just going to mess around until you're 30 anyway, which really helped me out because I was like, but I need to go out and act to do this and this. And he's like, essentially calm down, you know, are you savoring? By the way, savoring like meditation is a big thing with positive psychology. Are you savoring where you are right now? The people who you're with? And it's a time balance. You can't sit around and savor all the time and ignore your studying, for instance. But where you might feel that stress that you have to keep studying all the time. Um, a, you don't have to in one sense. And B, you can address these systems that weren't built for you to really savor. So we can change those systems. Yeah, I think just like a quick point to that. And then if anyone else has another question we go, can go into like the fact that, like you said earlier, GDP doesn't consider like caregivers, like mothers or fathers, whoever it is in a family, an asset or something that matters when assist, assessing the current state of the nation is just like wild because that just goes to show that GDP doesn't assess the full wellness of a nation because mothers and caregivers are what like provide the foundation and wellness of the future as in like the youth. So yeah, it's, GDP only assesses a very small slice of the pie, I guess. Um, but yeah, if anyone has other questions we can get into. Yeah, I, I kind of wanted to pose this question. It's probably very difficult to answer, but we're talking about all these metrics that dominate our lives. So it's like, how can we overcome these metrics? Uh, I guess you start by talking about it. On as big of a platform as possible. I don't think that most people, um, I mean, there might be like a, like a felt sense that something's wrong with like the paths that they're, they're being pushed down. But like, you, you need to be equipped with the vocabulary and like the the you know the statistics that are that point to how this exponential growth machine right is like really harming our ability to flourish etc um, otherwise like it's really hard to push back against like teachers parents that are like just super single-minded about certain metrics So um, I'd like to add more on that. So um, like how we could dominate, so how we could like overcome these metrics is to first become aware of them. I know a lot of people, like I, I, I've been studying a lot of social justice issues for a project I've been doing at school. I was doing like the, weight, the wage gap and I didn't even know it was that bad. So we need to first become aware about how bad the metrics are. Because once we get that, be aware of how bad they are, we get like motivation. And then after we get motivation to do, to like find a solution, then after that, we need to apply like the right methods to get towards that solution. Um, so, um, but yeah, that's, um, but so yeah, we need to like find out we need to like use our awareness to like harness motivation so then we can create solutions with our motivation and also help motivate others, like spread it out, get um, outreach to others. Um, so communication is key. Also like assessing ourselves. Like if you go to someone's social media and they have a certain amount of followers and you don't know who they are, are you automatically validating them for some reason? Like there's so many self-taught things, especially 
like in our generation, like aside from money and now like the internet and everything is coming into play. And it's so I see all the time, like my little brother has said that like, oh my God, they have this many followers. And like, if I knew them this many years ago, all of a sudden they're like this, it's like, who, who cares about that? Why is that all of a sudden like validating people? And like, we always have to be like self-aware um, in what we're also playing into even though it seems so subtle and like not a big deal it it really does play into things and creates a snowball effect of what we all consider success and whatnot um so yeah self-awareness and coming yeah (laughs) yeah well I was gonna say something really similar to what Julia just said is that like recognizing that the metrics that dominate people's lives are different for for every single person Um, like I know Maslow's hierarchy was mentioned before the things that dominate my life are so different than what dominates someone's life across the country or across the world it's just so inexplainably different what I'm thinking about versus what at like someone who lives at the house next to me is thinking about Um, there's there's no way to kind of standardize solutions um which makes solving them even more difficult. But I think recognizing that, you know, it's not, not everyone starting from the same place um, is a good way to overcome that. It makes a lot of sense. What that makes me think of is how we need to be empathetic with um, why other people are motivated, like, like how other people organize their lives. Like we have to understand that we, we may disagree with how people are making decisions, but maybe their entire lineage, <laughs> their family lineage has been like encouraging them to value certain things. Um, I know I, I've certainly been thinking a lot about that, how different generations, cultures, <clears throat> um, if it helps, so one thing, because these are all excellent points and studying artificial intelligence and ethics. uh, I've been really lucky the past four or five years, I get to travel a lot. So I've been to like Beijing and Thailand and Japan and China. And and, uh, there's a lot of things that I'm very keenly aware of, very different uh, language, et cetera. But I like thinking about the fact that I'm a parent a lot. And, you know, I assume you all probably are hopefully close to your you know, your parents or aunts and uncles or close guardians, whatever the right term is. Um, The positive psychology is a good thing to lean on because globally, there's actually a lot of things that make humans pretty similar. Um, And things like being with loved ones, you know, I'd say shockingly, but it's actually not shocking, right? Is we all are seeking love. We are seeking intimacy we are seeking connection and the connection um doesn't really is necessarily romantic i mean that's lovely too but is is things like being with family members and friends and and having you know purpose with those loved ones and that's why covid has been so challenging even more than normal because we're isolated isolation is very empirically a lot of data about Isolation increases depression very quickly because we are built for connection and that's common. Now, I'm not saying that people may prefer in the same way to express that connection. And that's where cultural and individual differences and families, that's up to you, right? But that doesn't deny like, you know, we all need oxygen. The oxygen of connection is other people. And I bring that up because I think it's a lovely thing to remember that even though there is so much that makes us different, and especially to Gary's point, values and, and politics and all that stuff, which can just get exhausting. Really, if you kind of keep trying to walk back and think about how do I approach these hard issues, the connection part is, is really central. And I, I love AI, I love technology, but where things can distract us Uh, I think it was Julia's point about social media. I went through that two books ago. I wrote a lot about this because I just was checking Twitter constantly. Did I get more followers? And and that, you know, I did it for a while and then I got sick of it because I realized I'm obsessing. This is not good time balance. This is not who I am. Um, 
So I only say that as an encouragement. And by the way, the world for the past 30, 40, 50 years has told us through GDP, et cetera, has told us that we need to ignore connection or not spend as much time on connection because we have to get back to work. We have to get back to productivity. And that's also why I'm really interested in studying a lot of indigenous traditions as of late. Indigenous traditions are very varied. It's, it's so diverse, it's almost strange to talk about indigenous traditions in one breath. But in the Maori tradition in New Zealand, I think it's Maori, the word, there is no word for growth, which I found fascinating. There's a word for like evolve or, or growing in the sense of like, look at that tree went from A to B, but not growth like I have to stockpile my stuff and grow my whatever. And that's their metric, right? That metric of, of not thinking about growth the same way we do in the West determines how they find value with their, their family and loved ones. That's so, yeah, it's like they, their only concept of growth is like a sustainable evolution or something like, something like that, right? Hmm. Um. Wait, okay, wait, I was trying to check my, if my mic was on, but to Adam's point in the chat and like people are agreeing with that, I think um, in my life trying to like figure out what metrics are important to me and also to John's point earlier about time, it's like I'm constantly assessing throughout my day, like obviously not everything is going to make you feel great all the time, but like um, the time I put into things and what I get back from that time is also an extreme like important thing to assess. Um, like Adam was saying with social media, like is there any value in that time that I'm using to scroll those hours? Like, what did I take from that? Do I pro you probably forget the first 30 videos that you scrolled through on TikTok. It's probably already out of your memory and like what value came from that. Um, so yeah, just like what you are getting from your time is a super important metric. I think it is important to look at the values that you have now and see where they came from, uh, since a lot of the time it's come from the institution somebody grew around and the values that you have um, afterwards, it continues to change and form based off, the, based off of the metrics in other institutions like school, church, et cetera. Uh, and so after realizing that it, it takes time to reflect, understand and form your own metrics If it's uh, useful, my, oh, sorry, okay. one. no, you go. So I was reading this book called Limitless by Jim Quick. Um, he's like a brain, um, uh, he, he's like, he, he's like a brain um, learning uh, person. So um, he was talking about like how, like our mindset is everything. And like, so we need to like realize our limitations in order to change them and make like new beliefs for ourselves. And also like other people kind of form our beliefs too. Um, like I, I, I've realized so am I after reading like some of the book, like I, like uh, I've been aware of like some of the negative beliefs I get across the day. Like you can't do this. You don't have the time to do it. Um, you can't do this. Your, your parents won't support you on it. Like stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so you, you kind of had to realize your limitations in order to change them and add new um, beliefs to to yourself so and about the world uh, what i was going to say is uh there's a famous psychologist uh, whose last name is schwartz his first name is escaping me but he listed uh 12 values that are common around the world so the word family uh the word nature and i I'll, i can send uh gary i'll send the rest um but when I say they're common, it doesn't mean that everyone around the world thinks of family the same way, but the word family is a common term amongst most humans, right? So I had a nonprofit for a while called the Hapathon Project, and we, we studied technology and well-being, that intersection. And what we asked people to do is to use these 12 values and then um, list on a scale of one to 10, just kind of knee-jerk reaction, how important that, that thing was to you. So for instance, on the phone for all of you right now, 
just out of interest, if zero is like nothing and 10 is like, it's the most important thing in the world, how important, and anyone say a number, how important is family for you right now, a zero to 10? And there's no wrong answer. This is just your subjective truth. But so Crystal is a four. All right, so Crystal, I'm going to use you as an example. Um, if you have these 12 values, and let's say outdoors, right? And Crystal, I'm, again, I'm just making this up. Let's say you really love the outdoors. So you gave that an eight, right? You just feel like you have to be outside. First of all, even just naming those 12 values and you saying it's a four and an eight, like I just mentioned, it's sort of a sense of you've just said, these are the values or how important each of these things are in my life. The experiment that we did is for two weeks, we, um, we emailed people. So at the end of the day, we just said, how much did you live to those values? Same thing, zero to 10, zero was you didn't spend any time that day. So say you stayed inside the entire day and you didn't even look out a window, then outdoors would be zero, right? And this is not overly scientific. It's more of just whatever. At the end of the two weeks, what we found and we had some other surveys that linked to kind of official ways to measure positive psychology type stuff. But just to keep it simple, we just aggregated the number of 14 for 14 days and divided, you know, zero to 10. And what we found, um, first of all, 95% of people said that um, just even tracking their values, because that's what we called it, values tracking, increased their sense of flourishing because they felt they were be able to, you know, they, they could take control in one sense of recognizing these aspects of their lives. The other thing is at the end of the two weeks, we said, hey, these are the numbers, you know, and, and just again, for instance, if someone said eight being outside with what they felt, felt their values were, and then over the two weeks, they never went outside, like every day they had like a two or a one or a zero. Then uh, we said, and there's scientific basis for this, you know, if you don't live to your values, then your well-being will decrease. Or if you don't know your values, then you can't actually know if you're living to them. And what's interesting is, you know, people have said this on the call, which I understand that there are certain things you can't track. And I, I hung out with a lot of geeks for a number of years. You can track a lot of stuff. And, you know, I've had friends who wear like 15 sensors and go to sleep and they know how much they've eaten and what they thought and all that type of stuff. And also, if you want a great TED talk, there's a guy named Chip Conley. I recommend you watch his TED talk. It's got like 18 million views. And he points out that the GDP, 60% of what the GDP measures is um, uh, service oriented industry. So like a hotel. And guess how hotels measure? Um, and encourage people to come back. It's surveys, right? Surveys are your subjective truth. You know, it's not empirical fact that Gary's six and my three year, you know, this, there. It's just us saying how we felt. But when you aggregate subjective data, this sort of magic alchemy happens and people think something has happened that transformed the esoteric to the objective. And there's a lot of things that are objective versus subjective. But the whole point here is that once you identify a metric as being important, there are so many ways you can measure it. And a lot of times the reason that it feels esoteric is you just haven't measured it yet. But that doesn't mean it's not real. I often talk about music because I play blues, right? I love blues music. Um, the instant music hits your ears, right? And we all like different types of music. But you don't have to wonder, is your body changing? Is your mind changing? Right. It's like eating a favorite food or uh, whatever. You just instantly go, ah, oh, I love this song. So and, and, and you might say, well, that's my taste versus someone else. But I can put you in an MRI machine and watch you relax. That's a metric that can be measured. And back to the values thing, just to wrap that up. It was so exciting to see people realizing that the values that they thought they held dear once they realized they never pursued them. They had empirical data for themselves, even just with two weeks to say, well, I guess I didn't really love being outside as much. And that's okay. Or likewise, people said, I didn't go outside for two weeks. I think that's one of the reasons I'm miserable. 
And then they started testing for themselves. And a lot of people got back to me and said, I was outside a lot more the last two weeks. I feel so much better. So by tracking your values, which may seem unusual, it's a way for you to test. Am I living every single day now, Friday night, right? You guys get off the phone Saturday. I cannot encourage you to do this enough because when you track your values, you've identified them at least in some way. And then you also are saying these things are so important to me because I know that they bring a sense of purpose driven value to my life, not just I'm getting a grade because someone told me to get a grade so I can get in school and make more money and be productive. And I'm a 40 and I realize I'm miserable then. No, <laughs> you have worth now. And if you're, you know, you're grateful and you understand the people that you're with, this amazing community that Gary and all of you have built, I mean, you guys are hitting it out of the park with this level of intelligent, heartful people working to better the world. You're already nailing the well-being stuff. And uh, that's the metric that's so much more important. I'm not trying to demean grades, by the way, and learning, but more if it's just like, get this grade so you can get the job and go out in the world and make money. The answer is no. No. Scott, do you have like, um, do you have like seven minutes for the reflection section? Is that, is that, would that work for you? Sure. All right, yeah, I can go ahead and send the notes in here for you all to look over. And while you're thinking of your reflection, I can go ahead and get us started. Um, I think this really made me think about how powerful metrics can be, especially to the point to where they can make us forget about our own flourishing. There's so many examples of that, but Gary's story really stuck out to me when you were talking about when you didn't have health insurance. Uh, I would presume that the reason why you didn't start worrying more about what you were doing is because of like your actual physical well-being, but because of like how much money it would cost if something happened to you, which is crazy. That's like, that's the point when you start caring about your mental wellness or your physical wellness. And like for school, um, I compromise my flourishing in order to meet a certain metric. Um, and so knowing how powerful they are, I feel like we oftentimes see their power being utilized in a negative way to where it's compromising or flourishing. But I think that also just speaks to how powerful they can be if we change the metrics um, for something good that accelerates people's flourishing. Yeah. Um... I, I, I think I, I thought of this when Ashley made a point a little while ago, how like it took me a while to, in the college process, which I brought up earlier, um, I knew for a while what the school that I wanted to go to was and, it, and I got into it and then it took me forever to make the decision that I was actually going to go. Um, a lot of because, a lot of because the metric that I was so used to was that I was going to go to the key to success is like going to a good college in the US or like one that has a really like a big name and like is an Ivy or something. Um, and it took me a long time to move past that. I think it was what helped me move past it was recognizing that it was a metric being applied to my life, being applied to say, this is how you will be successful or how you'll be happy or or fit into what your family or your community expects of you. Um, so I think just for me, just keeping, keeping on trying to realize what those metrics are in my life, because it is so hard <laughs> to see them. So I guess my, my reflection will be sort of based on the auras because it inspired me. <clears throat> Um, I was really moved when uh, I heard the example of how people can reduce their uh, cigarette addictions by like by doing like a simple habit where like you you do a mindfulness exercise before every time you you know would pick up a cigarette or, or something like that and apparently that like really decreased the amount that someone would smoke. And I was like, 
why why does what Ligora just said remind me of the cigarette story? I think it's because metrics can be addictive. Like they, like it's not it's not that different from you know a nicotine addiction, right? And I think the way to counteract that is by being really mindful, <laughs> like like not not letting it just like control your subconscious, but being like, wow, like that is kind of ridiculous that I'm letting this dictate my life. Um, and, and that makes me think of how when I like before I deleted my Facebook, I um, the the what helped me get to that decision was like really just reflecting on how I was deciding to pick up my phone compulsively and like what what was it and it was actually to increase a follower metric and I just felt like um, ashamed of myself and I was like okay the best way to cut this addiction is delete this thing so um for me what i see like for metrics um so they're usually like for me um they could be i think that they could be good or bad metrics um so uh i think metrics are like core beliefs that you like subconsciously have that means sometimes you aren't even aware that you're following them they remind me a lot of like the um the beliefs from like the book limitless i was reading um like how um, we need to like be aware. So I think that if you want to like be, if you want to like learn about your metrics and also be aware of them and maybe even change them and add new better metrics, um, you, you also need to have like the motivation to do that. And also, and also like um, follow like your good metrics, your good beliefs um, and try and avoid your, your bad beliefs and also the bad belief society uh, you have about the, the same goes for like your beliefs on society or and some of our beliefs like come from other people um you need to first verify you need to first verify like commonly hold beliefs from like other people in society because um like a lot of these are like um a lot of these beliefs are um sometimes like subject to um falsity i guess but yeah I think something that really resonated with me during the discussion was when Ashley um, said that metrics usually serve as a substitute for something else. And for uh, from that, it really reminded me of the of the it's the it's about the journey, not the destination discussion. Um, so it that that really um, made me reflect on like what type of journeys I've tried I've been taking to get to the destination I want. Um, and so the rest of this of our discussion has made me think a lot about the different journeys that everyone else has taken to reach that same destination. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm still trying to make sense of what the trick has been about. I guess, like, I guess something that I've been thinking about is just, like, people who decide the metrics have power. And so, like, you shouldn't let people decide what metrics you're measuring by. Um, and, like, I guess something that this trick has just caused me to think more about is like metrics should really assign value to more things um and to that story about like you know like taking that moment for mindfulness before you like take the cigarette I mean like that mindfulness practice is really a process to help you consider like other dimensions of value and incorporate that into your decision making and so it's like accounting for the fact that like the metric like does not do that already um I know. No, I found that really helpful. Uh, uh, and forgive me, it was um, Ashley, what you just said. 
you know, one thing is metrics can be beautiful too, you know, in the sense of what's a metric of Gen Z being well heard. I don't know. You tell me, I'm not Gen Z. When do you all on this call feel heard? When do you feel valued? Is it when, I'm using this as the not probably example, right? Someone's like, get this grade and go from a 90 to 91. Is that how you feel heard? Or do you feel heard when a loved one or a friend says, hey, grades are great, but tonight let's spend some time and just be together. I don't know, play a game, something, look at each other. Um, where even if, if one of you is like, do what? Like, I got to study or whatever. And savor that. The metric of savoring, right? The word metric, and don't get me wrong, uh, uh, for Ashley and everyone else, I understand like if metric is like, because the people who have power are oftentimes the ones who say, and certainly with GDP, these are the metrics that society, this determines that society is um, successful. That's actually what the GDP, you know, was supposedly a definition of societal flourishing or prosperity. It's not. It doesn't measure caregiving. It's ludicrous. So my point here is that, and this is where I really admire what you're all doing and what Gary, what you've created, that amazing video of CBS Sunday morning, you know, this idea of civics. And if, if you are all saying a metric of success is that even before we're at the age that we can formally vote in the US, our voices will be heard. And also things like, I'm really excited, you know, like you guys have power now, which you know this, but to buy things or not. And if you ever decided to rally together and say, we will not buy from these companies because they don't honor the metric of Gen Z or young people, your voices are powerful. And again, I'm not trying to advocate that you do something that you don't want to do. I just mean that there's power in saying these metrics are important. And I'm also not saying you should force those metrics onto someone else. But metrics a lot of times mean that you're saying we see something in a new way and we are claiming that this has value. And the metrics are simply the way that we're saying it has value. So metrics might be once COVID, dear God, ever ends and we all have vaccines. Maybe the first part of every conversation would be appropriately, you know, maybe it's a shaking of hands or putting a hand on someone's shoulder. We bring touch back to the world. And again, very appropriately, you know, what I'm saying here, right? The point is, is that like, what if that was a metric? And for a while, everyone's like, that's a really weird metric. Why is it weird? It's because it's new. And why is it weird? Because the main metric that everyone can always go back to is, I gotta go, I, I gotta go to work. I gotta get, I gotta get more money. I gotta increase my grades. I gotta have exponential growth. No one's ever gonna look at you funny in one sense when you say that, but they will miss you. They'll say, oh, it's too bad that Leora has to go back to grades or that Ashley has to go back to whatever. And I'm not saying you shouldn't all the time, but many times, what if the world said that when you get out of college or even if you go to college, the main priority was to be present for one another and to love one another. What if that was the metric? It's the metric in a lot of places. Um, and my reflection would be um, the metrics like push in our face the most are not the end all be all. And if anything, they don't assess like the most important aspects of, I guess, collective well being would be the word. Um, so obviously, like with these conversations, like it's our job to amplify these conversations and assess in our own lives if we're like playing into what strays us away from amplifying like the importance of caregiving and overall overall wellness, et cetera. Um, and test that mindfulness that people were talking about earlier in our own lives. So we can also help like actually tell people actionable items for how to move this way. Awesome, thank you all so much for sharing. Um, before we end, John, since this was your first trek, I wanted to ask what you thought about the trek overall. That was amazing. I really appreciate the invite. Uh, I, th I love the three parts of it. 
Um, I tend to over talk, but I also, I know I'm sort of a guest, I think. And so thank you for letting me share. I really appreciate that. But I just, I learned a ton from everyone. And um, I think overall, I, I think it's fantastic. Thanks for taking all the notes, uh, Madison. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd love to come back for more. And I'd love to hear, you know, or read the collective treks, you know, the insights that you've had. And, and I hope you all know this. I want to tell you a metric for me is I, I so savor and crave the insights of people under uh, 22, 21, 20, um, because you are literally the people who are going to be around in the world I'm trying to help create or make better. And so it's a metric for me is how would I do my work with honor and dignity and listening well, if the people who literally I'm trying to build the word for, which by the way, are my kids, they're 18 and 15. I didn't listen to you. So I'm trying, you know, and the, I'm so excited that Gary, I got introduced to Gary and your work, all of you, um, anything I can do to amplify your voices in this work, I will do the best I can. Really appreciate that. And uh, check out the Humanity 2.0 white paper we were, we've been working on. Um, and we'd love to jam with you on that like next week or, or whatever. I, we, we have a meeting next week, actually, right? Yeah. I think it's Tuesday, I yeah. think. So, yeah, okay. We'll see you then. Awesome. Yeah. All right, have yeah. a great weekend, everyone. Yeah. It was great Bye. to have you. Bye. Bye. Bye.